Hello and welcome to another episode of the Daily Remedy Podcast. Today, we're going to focus on the news and begin the first of what I would hope to be many installments analyzing the weekly news as we see them. Now, what I've done is I've compiled highlights of all the basic news that will come on healthcare sites like WebMD, MedPage Today, Healthline, and whatnot, and I put them side by side. And I find this to be a very interesting exercise because when we take all the news clips, just the headlines and the bylines, take all the head news clips and put them side by side, you start to notice key trends. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know one of the key trends that we're seeing are weight loss medications, the famous or infamous GLP-1s, semaglutide, trizepatide, commercially known as Ozempic, Wegovy, Monjaro, Zepbound. The names never end. I can tell you this, the marketing department at these pharmacy consulting firms are making gangbusters out of coming up with new names for these various medications. But remember, they're still the same drug, semaglutide, trizepatide. Now there's other classes, but those two are the most commonly used medications for the weight loss. And what I found it very interesting is that you see a lot of these articles about semaglutide now beneficial for cardiovascular health. And I see semaglutide now beneficial for kidney health. Semaglutide helpful for generalized inflammation. And now I'm starting to see articles that correlate GLP-1 medications with various foods. So now you're getting into the food packaging industry. And what's very interesting is that there's an entire cottage industry built around one medication. That is in stark diametric opposition to how physicians and indeed the healthcare system as a whole would look at medications before. Previously, we would look at the clinical care and then prescribe the medications based off of our working diagnosis or some set of clinical data, be it symptoms or signs that would then dictate the clinical course of action. Now it's switched and the term I came up with and what I start to do is when I review all of these news clips and I have them side by side, I take notes. And the key phrase that came out was purpose-driven medications. And what I mean by that is now the medications are taking the centralized role. The clinical care focuses around the context of the medication, whereas before it was the medication was dependent to what the clinical care was. So the clinical diagnosis and the care then dictated what medications we have. If you want to look at it like a solar system analogy, the sun was the clinical diagnosis and all the planets revolving around the sun were the medications. They were dependent on the clinical diagnosis. It's now switched. The medication is the sun and the clinical care are the planets rotating around that sun the new sun, the medication-focused sun. Now, what, what, is the, what are the implications of purpose-driven medications? Well, it ushers in a new type of healthcare consumerism. The best analogy I can give is going to the grocery store. When you go to the grocery store, you typically know you're gonna get milk, you're gonna get eggs, you're gonna get bread, and then you go to the checkout line and you purchase whatever you're going to buy. Nowadays, you start to see people purchase specific items. I want X eggs from this farm. I want this type of milk from this store. Now, the products dictate what the shopping experience is like. Are you going to purchase your goods from Amazon? Are you going to purchase your goods from a wholesaler like Costco? A specialty retailer like Whole Foods or a discount retailer like Walmart. The foods themselves dictate the mechanism of distribution, meaning you don't choose to go to a grocery store and purchase what they have. You go to the grocery store because you already know what they have. In the same vein, you seek clinical care based on the medications available. You don't seek medical care 
and then ask for the medications based off of the physician or nurse provider or mid-level provider's clinical diagnosis. The roles are reversed. And that's critical because in the grocery analogy, that shift impacts retail consumerism. Now, there's a term that isn't quite common, but I think should be, and it's called healthcare consumerism. And that is the behavior of the patients in dictating how they consume their care. Healthcare consumerism helps to explain, or at least formalize, this trend we're seeing where patients are now seeking the clinical care based on the medications and not receiving the medications based on the clinical care. This shift is what I like to call, and again, purpose-driven medications. And the biggest tell, the canary in the coal mine, if you will, to see just how pervasive this trend is, you can look no further than a play on word, repurposing medications. Repurposing medications has become more common of late, but it's been a tried and true method in the pharmaceutical industry for decades. Certain drugs used for one clinical purpose are then repurposed, gone through a set of clinical studies, clinical trials, and then utilized for a new purpose. The most famous example I can say, maybe not the most famous, but one of the most famous examples would be a Viagra, Sildenafil. This medication was used as a vasodilator for the vasculature in the lungs, the blood vessels in the lungs, specifically the arteries. And it's still used for that purpose today. But when I say Viagra, you don't think increased vasodilation in the lungs. You think erectile dysfunction because the medication was found in preliminary clinical studies to not just vasodilate the vasculature in the lungs, but to vasodilate the vasculature in the genital area, hence promoting erections. So Viagra is effectively an example of how medications can be repurposed to fit a clinical need. From vasodilating lungs to address pulmonary hypertension to vasodilating the genital vasculature to combat erectile dysfunction. Repurposing medications is, in many ways, how this weight loss craze began. Semaglutide, trisepatide, they were originally designed to be anti-hyperglycemic medications used for diabetic patients. And indeed, when you look at the insurance coverage for these medications, oftentimes patients who have diabetes get insurance coverage for weight loss needs. Those who don't have an existing diagnosis of diabetes or those who are not morbidly obese, obese type 2, they tend not to get insurance coverage. And a lot of that goes back to the historical legacy of these medications and how they initially achieved approval from the FDA. But now, in this era of purpose-driven medications, where patients will seek the medications and then cater the clinical care around those medications, you're going to see an increase in the repurposing of medications. And that's not a bad thing. Medications have many purposes, serve many clinical needs. And anytime you ingest any medication, whether that's orally, intramuscularly, intravenously, there's always benefits and side effects. The benefits are multifold and the side effects are multifold. By that logic, you can consider medications, in a sense, an opportunity cost, right? You're balancing the benefits against the side effects. So by repurposing medications to fit a clinical need, whether it's weight loss, sexual health, you're increasing patient empowerment because now you're giving patients more options to dictate their clinical care and more options to seek the medications that are in line with their clinical needs. And that's a critical change that you're going to see. So in summary, if we're to start looking at all of this in aggregate, focus on two things. One, healthcare consumerism trends are favoring purpose-driven medications. And the most overt tell of this trend will be a rise in repurposing medications to fit certain clinical needs. And with that, take care.